and material is all going to be on the next exam. So chapter eight, we were talking about transport. So active versus passive transport. And then I want to talk about dialysis. So the examples that we've done here are all examples of passive transport. So if you remember that passive, passive transport, these are all processes that require no energy because they allow molecules to evenly distribute themselves. So they're always going to allow molecules to go from high concentration to low concentration. And that is like the natural process of the universe, right? To spread out, to become more disordered, to not all be in one little collected area. So they are always talking about movement of molecules from high concentration to low concentration. And they will move and continue to move until concentrations are equal. So passive transport examples, the first one that I've got over on the far left is the example of simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is when molecules just move, these are solute molecules, move from high concentration to low concentration. And my example in this one are how gases move. So oxygen and carbon dioxide, one, they're gases, two, they're nonpolar. So the cell membrane is really not a barrier to them. They have the ability to move through the nonpolar phospholipid. Remember that this part is the hydrophobic barrier. So this part blocks salts, water, polar molecules like sugar, things like that can't move through the layer of the cell membrane. And that's what keeps them on one side of the membrane or the other. But gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide, one, they're nonpolar. So they're a lot like the barrier. So that allows them to like dissolve through the barrier. They don't have to have a carrier. They don't have to have a channel or anything like that. They just move from high concentration to low concentration. So, so the red balls represent oxygen. And you can see that oxygen then diffuses through the membrane from high concentration outside of cells to low concentration inside of cells. On the opposite side of the coin, we have carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is always being made inside of the cell. So that means that its concentration is always increasing inside of the cell. So inside of the cell, it's at much higher concentration. And that is going to then prompt it to diffuse from inside of the cell, diffuse through the cell membrane, out of the cell. So carbon dioxide's going out, oxygen's going in because they're both just moving by simple diffusion. The middle one is also an example of diffusion. This, notice that you have like six little red balls outside of the cell and only one inside of the cell in this middle one. But in this one, notice that it has to use a protein in order to be able to pass through. So that protein is a channel so remember when we talked about the structure of the plasma membrane or cell membrane, we said there's phospholipids, there's cholesterol, and there's proteins in the membrane. That is an integral protein, and that integral protein creates like a channel to allow molecules to move in or out. But it's really, these are not just general channels. They don't just open like a door and let anything in or out. These channels are very specific for certain molecules. So this is actually a really good example of how glucose moves in and out of the cell. So when you eat, your blood sugar goes up. So glucose is high outside of the cell in concentration, low inside of the cell. As long as you have what present? What do you need to have in order for this channel to open? What is insulin? Mm -hmm. So as long as insulin is present, that activates this channel. So the glucose channel kind of goes like this. The glucose molecule goes into the channel and then it does this and drops the glucose into the cell. And then it opens back up and it closes and it opens and it closes. Each time it opens, it moves the glucose into the cell so glucose moves from high concentration to low concentration, and it does that until the concentrations are equal. 
right? Because that's really what drives diffusion is that we want things to become so that they're actually equal inside and outside of the cell. And that is going to allow the cell to have glucose to be able to use it to produce energy. If you don't have insulin, that channel stays closed. Okay, so the only way that that channel opens up and starts doing the transport of glucose from outside of the cell in is that you've got to have insulin. It's kind of like the key that turns it on. Otherwise, it just remains closed and glucose stays very high outside, but the cells can't gain access. They call that facilitated diffusion. It's facilitated because you have to have a channel because glucose is polar. Glucose is hydrophilic. Glucose cannot pass through the membrane. It has to have a carrier to do it. So facilitated diffusion, facilitated transport has to have a carrier or, a, or sorry, it has to have a channel. And that is all because glucose is hydrophilic. So the cell membrane, the phospholipids are a barrier to the movements of glucose to freely pass through the membrane, it's got to have that channel in order to do so. But both of those don't require energy. So there's no energy required in order to move gases, in order to move glucose, but notice both of those are going high concentration to low concentration. So the one that's over on the right is different from all of the others. So this one Look at the arrows and tell me which way is this concentration going. Yes, do you see that it's going from where it's low concentration inside of the cell? There's only one little blue ball. Outside of the cell, there's six, but we're moving it. That one single one is being moved out where there's already a lot. Do you see that this is like the opposite of passive transport? They call this active transport. Active transport always moves molecules from low concentration to high concentration. And this goes against disorder, right? This goes against entropy, goes against the natural order of the universe. Things like to spread out. So this is not going to happen on its own. So this is going to go from low concentration to high concentration. You have to have a channel to do this, and you have to use energy. So notice at the bottom, there's ATP involved. So the cell actually has to use energy to do this because it's not going to happen all by itself. So you're like, well, why would the cell bother to do this kind of thing? These this imbalance that is created by pumping or moving things into areas of high concentration, this can allow the cell to do certain kinds of activities. Good example for this, you have to have this formed in order for nerve impulses to be generated. So the way that nerve cells generate a nerve impulse is they create this imbalance. They pump sodium outside of this nerve cell, potassium inside of the nerve cell, and when a nerve impulse is stimulated, that's the movement of those ions. So the impulse is the movement of ions along the membrane of a neuron, and it can send things at speeds of 100 meters per second. Very fast, rapid communication. As soon as that nerve impulse goes past, the sodium and potassium pump kicks back in, sodium gets moved out, potassium gets moved back in, and it actually like resets itself. So nerve impulses, in order to generate a nerve impulse, you use lots of ATP and active transport to be able to prepare the nerve cell to be able to send a nerve impulse. Second example, muscle contraction. In order for a muscle to contract, calcium has to be available in the cell. But if calcium's in the cell all the time, then muscle proteins would always be interacting. And so those muscle proteins would never relax. So you'd be like this all the time, 
right? So those muscle cells would always be in partial contraction. So instead, the muscle cell takes its calcium and it pumps it into an organelle so that it's taken away from the muscle proteins. So then the muscle proteins slide into their relaxed state. The only time that those muscle proteins are going to contract is when calcium is present and that causes them to overlap, pull on one another and create that contraction. So the muscle cell can like stop contraction by pumping calcium into an organelle. And then it's right there when the muscle needs to contract. Now we can release the calcium and stimulate that contraction. So muscle contraction, another example. So I always think of active transport. It helps the cell to do specific things, okay? Def um, passive transport is really to try and kind of like keep things into in a balance. Active transport really creates an imbalance maintains an imbalance, makes things in high concentration versus low concentration, and keeps it that way, but it allows the cell to do its specific work. Okay, osmosis is a passive transport. Osmosis is movement of solvent, or just always think of osmosis with water, right? Because water can move through channels. Chan the water channels never close. Water channels are always open, but they only allow water to pass through to try and maintain a solute concentration balance. Last thing. So last topic is this application. Okay. So you can think of osmosis and diffusion, but a good application of this is dialysis. So dialysis is a process that they use with the kidneys. So first off, just a little bit of information, some the AMP, your kidneys. So one, your kidneys are about four inches long. They're about two and a half inches wide, about an inch or so thick, and they legit look like a kidney bean. <laughs> you know, like kidney beans, like in chili, okay? And I'm not sure who named which, okay? It might have been the kidney was named after the bean or the bean was named after the kidney. But if you look at it, it has that kind of shape. It's what the kidney looks like. You have two of them. They are, or most people do, and they are anchored in the back wall of your abdominal pelvic cavity, okay? So, like, if you pull out all the intestines and such, you see them. They look like they're, like, stuck in the back wall. Their job, your kidneys, are your a blood filter. So, you have two kidneys. They are a blood filter, and their job is to filter out excess water, and salts and all the waste, okay? Any waste molecules, any dissolved waste that you don't need, well, you wouldn't need waste. All dissolved waste gets filtered out, any excess water and excess salts. That's usually what is in urine. Urine is like 99% water and then any of the solutes that are dissolved are because the body doesn't need them. So the goal is we wanna remove all the waste molecules and excess salt and water. We don't want to remove all the salt and water. You want to maintain a balance. So what should be, what would be isotonic, that's the amount of water you want to keep in the blood. Anything above that, you want to filter out. Same thing with the salts. You have normal physiological saline, normal physiological conditions that are balanced salts. That's what you want to keep in the blood. If you have more than you need, you want to filter that out. So that's what the kidney's job is. And the way they do this is they have microscopic filters. The microscopic filters are called nephrons. So in the kidneys, you have a million nephrons in one kidney. And these nephrons can effectively filter your entire blood supply 35 times a day. So about every 40 minutes, your entire blood supply goes through your kidneys and excess water, excess salt, and all the fluid waste get filtered out. And that is why 
you basically like keep your blood, salt, water, and waste always in this balance because that's all the kidneys do. Well, they do some other things, but pretty much that's all the kidneys job is, is just to pull excess water, salts, and all the waste out of the blood all the time. So I said, you have a million per kidney. In fact, you only need a half a million nephrons to have normal adequate filtration. This is why people can donate a kidney. So you're born, if you have two functioning kidneys, you actually have four times more nephrons than you need. So you really only need about a half a kidney, okay? As long as you have a half a kidney, you're still good. You still would have adequate filtration. That is why people donate a kidney because having just one kidney is fine. You could be born with one kidney and you'd still may never even know that because your normal kidney is functioning fine. The problem comes into play with different diseases. So one, if you had a lot of kidney infections. So kidney infections, not just like a bladder infection, but like talking about an infection that ends up affecting those microscopic filters. They, if they get damaged, they become scar tissue. They don't grow back. They don't reform. They just shut down. So somebody that has had chronic kidney infections, if you were born with any kind of kidney issue, where your kidneys just weren't as functional as they're supposed to be. What was another one that we talked about that said it can cause kidney damage? Kidney stones, developing stones, remember where it can actually like block flow of urine and then urine can back up. That could cause kidney damage. Diabetes. Okay, so diabetes is a really big one because hyperglycemia makes your blood thick. These are microscopic filters. If there's too much pressure on the filter, the filter blows, okay? So the filter won't be able to withstand that pressure. And if the filter blows up or it like tears, it just becomes scarred over and it stops working. So yeah, you're born with 2 million nephrons. However, diseases can lead to loss of those nephrons. Last one, hypertension. Anything that puts a lot of pressure on the filter, these filters are just cells and it's basically like a single cell layer. So they're pretty strong, but if the pressure gets too great, that can cause those filters to blow or to like rupture. And if they do, then they're just gonna shut down. So you need about 100,000 nephrons for normal kidney filtration. So, like I said, you can really function on 500,000, half a kidney. But if you start to damage those nephrons, when you start getting down into the 400,000, 300,000, 200,000, they might notice that you have somewhat impaired kidney function. But if you go below 100,000, then they tell you that you are in the stages of kidney failure. So kidney failure means now I'm not filtering. So now I'm not getting rid of the water that's in excess. I'm not getting rid of the salts that is in excess. And I'm not getting rid of the wastes that I need to. So that, because wastes and all of these, these small molecules, they all get filtered and balanced in the kidney. If a person's kidneys are failing, and so this is when we're talking about less than 100,000 nephrons in function, when they get close to that 10,000, then they say you're not having adequate filtration. And waste molecules build up, water molecules build up, excess salt molecules build up because the kidney's not working. So there, they have to put the person on dialysis. So the one we're gonna talk about is hemodialysis. There's, and hemo, you think of what? Blood, so this is dialyzing the blood. There's also peritoneal dialysis. So there is a second type that you can do. We're really gonna focus on hemodialysis. And here's what happens. So the blood is removed from the patient. So that means that you have to have a needle, you have to have a port, there have to be some kind of way to draw blood out of the person's bloodstream. It is then passed through a machine called a dialysis machine. So this machine has a semi-permeable membrane. What that means is this machine, the tube inside, 
has microscopic holes in it. So as the blood moves through, molecules, so we'll say if this is wastes. If I have a lot of waste molecules in the blood as it passes through, and there's no waste molecules in the fluid outside, diffusion says waste molecules are going to go which way? Mm -hmm. That they'll come out of the tubing. So they'll move from high concentration to low concentration, diffusing out of that tubing. Same thing if I have water. If there's too much water in the blood compared to the water that's in the tubing, that will cause water to move by osmosis. If I have too much sodium or too much chloride, that, anything that's in excess, is going to diffuse out of the tubing, always moving from high concentration to low concentration. So here shows the dialysis machine. So you, do you notice that there's two tubes connected to this patient? Okay, one of the tubes is drawing blood out of the patient, and then if you follow that tube, you see that it goes through the dialyzing, the dialysis machine, and then notice that there's another tube that comes back in. So that means they have to have two IV lines, two ports, two ways, one to remove blood, one to put blood back in. This dialyzing solution, sometimes they call it the dialysate, this dialyzing solution that is in the machine is isotonic for all of the water concentration and balanced for all of the ions and nutrients that you should have in the blood. So in the dialysis solution, the concentration of sodium is like 140 which would be milliequivalents per liter, okay? So remember those milliequivalents just based on the charge and the amount. That's what should be in your blood if your blood is perfectly balanced. Potassium levels, 1.0. If your blood's perfectly balanced, then that's the concentration that that potassium would be. All the ones in this list, they're all what they call an iso, that would be a physiological or isotonic condition balanced amounts of salts, this is what your blood would be if your kidneys were completely functional. One thing that's missing in this, there are no wastes. Two common wastes are urea. Urea is a nitrogen waste that you end up making with muscle metabolism. So when your body like either uses proteins for energy, builds and breaks down um, proteins, nitrogen waste is a common waste molecule. Urea is the most common waste molecule that is filtered out by your kidneys. The other one we actually talked about a little bit. Remember with gout, we talked about uric acid and I told you that uric acid is just a byproduct of cell like activity. Normally, it gets filtered out, but if your kidneys aren't functioning, that's going to be in higher concentration. But in the dialysis fluid, there's none. So, person comes in, and their blood salts and water concentration, and even their nutrient concentrations can be all out of whack. Maybe their blood sugar is way too high. Maybe their blood sugar is way too low. Maybe their sodium is higher than normal. Maybe it's lower than normal. But what is going to happen because this tubing that is in here has that semi-permeable membrane, has those microscopic holes in it, as the blood moves through this tubing, blood cells, proteins don't move out. They're too big to pass. But the little solute particles, like the ones we have listed, they have the ability to move freely. They're always going to go from high concentration to low concentration. So if this is the patient's blood that's passing through that, that tubing and the sodium level is 160, which way will sodium go? Will sodium go out of the blood into the, into the dialysis fluid or the opposite direction? It's going to go out, right? So it's going to go from 160 to 140. High concentration to low concentration. What about potassium? In this example, potassium is going to go 
out. It's going to come out of the blood. So it's just like sodium. They're both at higher concentration, moving to lower concentration. What about calcium? So calcium's 125 in the fluid, only one, or sorry, 1.25 in the in the fluid and only 1.2 in the blood. So it's too low in the blood. So then we can have diffusion in the opposite direction. So calcium will actually diffuse into the blood to help bring the blood into a balanced concentration for calcium. What about bicarb? It's gonna go into the blood. So notice that bicarb in this patient, their bicarbonate is much lower than what it is in the fluid. So that means the, the bicarbonate ions will diffuse from the fluid into the blood. So it's not just one direction of flow. Molecules are going to move from one side to the other based on their concentration. Wherever it's at higher concentration, it's gonna go to lower concentration. So magnesium, what that, what's that one gonna do? In or out? It's gonna come out of the blood, right? So 1.5 to 0.5. Chloride, it's gonna go into the blood. And then glucose, so with this patient, glucose would go in. So it's at higher concentration, 5.5 as a balanced concentration would give you a blood sugar of about 80. So this person comes in and their blood sugar is closer to 60. So by glucose diffusing into the blood, it's gonna help get their blood sugar in a balanced concentration. So now, the patient with urea and uric acid, what do you think the concentration of urea and uric acid is in the blood for this patient? It's higher than zero, absolutely, okay? So it is going to have, so the concentration of urea and uric acid is going to be high. And there's none in the dialysis fluid. So that's gonna promote what? That's gonna promote movement of urea and uric acid out of the blood. But now, optimally, don't we wanna get rid of all of the urea and uric acid? We don't like, so say that this is 100. So if I have like 100 milligrams per deciliter of each, if they go till they're equal, then what would it be? 50-50, right? So if I start off with 100 and zero and I had diffusion, it would diffuse till they were like 50-50 but I don't want any waste in the blood. So how you fix this is you constantly add fresh fluid with the isotonic condition and you drain away you drain away fluid. So the fresh fluid coming in will always be 140 in sodium, one in potassium, 34 in bicarb. It'll have all these conditions and it'll have no urea. So what's that gonna do? If I had 100 and 100 and now I have 50 and 50, but now I have 50 and zero. So now what's that gonna do? 25 and 25, but now I've got zero again over here. So that's gonna bring the urea down to 12 and a half, but then I'm removing that. So that's going to cause the waste to get lower and lower and lower and lower. So I don't actually have, with this one, I don't have it come so that it's equal because it wouldn't be equal unless they were both zero. And that's really how you end up being able to pull excessive amounts of salts or water or waste out I continued to do this and eventually the patient's blood and the dialysis fluid concentrations are gonna get equal. So that eventually the patient's blood will be 140 in sodium because I'm constantly pulling off more and more excess sodium. Once they're equal, does any diffusion happen? No, once I'm at equal, now it's gonna stay that way. So at the end of the dialysis session, my patient's blood concentration should really be equal to the dialysis fluid concentration. So how long does this take? Nope. Anybody ever had a family member with dial do dialysis? How long? A couple hours. Three to four hours. <laughs> how many times a week do they go? Three times a week. So this is a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. 
okay? Three times a week, it's either your entire morning or your entire afternoon, three days a week. Three days a week, you sit in a chair and you get hooked up. And then over time, those blood vessels end up scarring and you end up with knots. So she had like knots on her arms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where those, so three to four hours each time. And this is three times a week. So remember I told you your kidneys filter your blood 35 times a day. So this, you're only doing it every other day. So you're on a dialysis machine. Basically, your blood has to get filtered 75 times through this machine in order for it to equal what functional kidneys can do. So the patient, when they wake up in the morning before dialysis, their sodium, potassium, all these electrolytes, their, their water levels, their waste molecules, all out of whack. Okay, Even if they're really careful about what they eat, because if you're not getting rid of wastes, Right? So some people, like, they get very careful, like, I only eat like this, and I try to eat, like, very specific foods because otherwise everything goes haywire. Try not to eat super salty because it's not going anywhere. It's just going to stay in the blood. But even still, you wake up, and these are out of balance. You go to the – and so they say – people say they just feel bad. I just don't feel good. Like, I feel blah. I mean, like, I feel almost nauseous. They go to the dialysis center, get hooked up run dialysis for three to four hours. So everything that was like this is now like this in three to four hours. That is exhausting. So most people describe after they get out of dialysis, they're so tired. All they want to do is go home and sleep. So you go home and sleep for a few hours. So how much of that day, you're talking four to eight hours of that day is just taken up with prepping and recovery for dialysis. And you got to do this three days a week. It really depends on the why, right? So if, so for example, if you have hypertension, so if you have hypertension that's not easily controlled and you end up with kidney damage, like to give you another kidney while you still have hypertension, that's not really going to help that kidney because that kidney is going to end up being damaged. So if you are diabetic and you have hyperglycemia and you can't keep it under control, giving you a new kidney is not as much that's like, you're sort of setting yourself up for failure. So it's really almost easier just to do this. And I know people that have been on dialysis for 25 years, their, like their entire life. So this is like almost half of their week is spent either in prep or recovery from dialysis. Those days in between dialysis is when you feel better. So that's when your blood is a little more balanced. The waste molecules are a little bit better. But this is really a big, huge issue. Now, if there was some kind of trauma that caused that kidney to be damaged and led you to have to be on dialysis in replacement of the kidney, getting a kidney transplant, if that's a potential, then yes, they put you on a list. And so, but even for kidney transplants, like seven years is about the average lifespan. So it's one that's really difficult to make sure that you match very well. And then you've got to be on those anti- um, the immunosuppressants, the anti-rejection meds, and everything for the rest of your life. So it's rough. But this has taken people that would have otherwise died, that people have lived for decades by doing dialysis. So they're sort of the back and forth. Like, this sounds exhausting, but what is the other option? Because if you can't keep your water, salts, and wastes under control, then the body ceases to function. So that's like a really good example. And whether you're talking about people or animals, like there is dialysis that they do on animals. They do peritoneal dialysis. There's hemodialysis, trying to like keep those kidneys functioning, flushing them, doing all kinds of different medications. But that's why your kidneys are so important. Okay, so that finishes chapter eight material. So that is everything that you will see on this take home exam. So just I'll post this one in Moodle, like the marked up version of it. Chapter nine is going to be new exam material. Okay, so this will be exam five material. We nine, 10, and then whatever we cover in 11, there's 
not very, there's the only math in this one is just pH calculations. Everything else is really just theory. Chapter 10 is all about proteins. Chapter 11 is all about nucleic acids. So we're sort of like deep into all of the nutrient molecules and cellular molecules. So first things about acids and bases are just kind of general characteristics. So people that studied this, the first one was Arrhenius that studied this, and he did this like a long time ago. So this was like 6, 800 BC. And he described characteristics of acids and said, okay, well, acids taste sour. So think of like lemons, vinegar, limes. They contain citric acid. Vinegar is acetic acid. So it has a sour taste. He found that these are really good at dissolving grease. So like you might see lemon juice in your dishwashing detergent. If you get a big grease spot on your concrete, like on the driveway, you can get a chemical called muriatic acid. It's actually hydrochloric acid. It is about 20% hydrochloric acid. And you can put that on there and then wash it off and it like completely dissolves the grease. So it's really good at getting grease spots. You just have to make sure you do a lot of rinsing. Because if you don't, the acid can eat away the concrete too. So you don't want a hole in your concrete. So that's not a good plan. Okay. So it's good at dissolving grease. One other thing that acids can do is they can also react with metals and generate hydrogen gas. So all these different characteristics that we're seeing. He said, okay, if you take an acid and we'll use hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is stomach acid. Hydrochloric acid in its pure form is a liquid. If you add it to water, so if I hydrate it, it is a strong electrolyte and it forms 100% hydrogen ions and chloride ions. So he defined or said acids have a characteristics that they produce hydrogen ions when you put them in water. So hydrogen ions, is this H plus. So then later on, it's science um, chemists, Bronsted and Lowry, they were looking at acids and they were like, well, that's a very general way of describing it. So yes, acids, when you put them in water, they make hydrogen ions. But they said, not only do they make hydrogen ions, but acids like to give their hydrogen ions to other things. They like to react with other things, so they called them hydrogen donors or proton donors because really, if you look at hydrogen on the periodic table, hydrogen is atomic number one, which means it has one proton and one electron. So a hydrogen ion is a what? It's just a proton because it's H+, plus, which means it's lost its electron. So if hydrogen only had one proton and one electron and we take the electron away, all it leaves is just the proton. So H plus equals a proton. They're really saying the same thing. These guys just tried to get super technical about it. <laughs> so what he said is, if you take hydrochloric acid, it really reacts with water. And in doing so, you end up with H3O plus and the chloride ion. So Braun said and Lowry said, so that hydrochloric acid gives its hydrogen ion to water. So it's a proton donor. Okay. So do you see like HCl just becomes Cl minus? So in doing so, that chlorine loses its hydrogen. So the HCl donates its hydrogen to the water molecule, making H3O plus. So if you see these terms, they're really all saying the same thing. H plus equals a proton equals H3O plus if you're in water. They're all the same, okay? So the term proton, proton donor, just think of it means it's giving a hydrogen ion, H plus, hydrogen ion. The H3O plus, that is called a hydronium ion. That is considered a polyatomic. It's on the next slide. It is a hydronium ion. Okay, so acids taste sour. They're really good at dissolving grease and they like to give their hydrogens to other things. Okay, they like to react with other things and donate that hydrogen. 
So there's like the hydronium ion down at the bottom, H3O plus. So it's a water molecule with an extra hydrogen ion added to it. So then they started looking at bases. And so they're like, okay, so what's a base? So bases, they kind of have like this opposite side of the coin type of characteristics. Acids are sour, bases taste bitter. So good examples of bases, strong coffee, tea, you kind of get this like bitter taste in the back of your throat. Herbs, a lot of herbs will have this kind of flavor. Like if you get like fresh herbs, like, like even basil, put it in your mouth, you kind of get this weird taste in the back of your throat. Vitamins. <laughs> if you've ever taken like the big regular, like now everybody has gummy vitamins and they taste wonderful. So nobody complains when I was a kid. <laughs> well, I did have Flintstones then. <laughs> but prior to that, prior to any kind of chewable, if you ever had to take a multivitamin and you swallow it, you'd end up with this like weird aftertaste. I just remember prenatal vitamins. Now this is 30 plus years ago. Prenatal vitamins look like horse pills and you would like taste them all morning, which was wonderful for morning sickness. Yeah, here, swallow this thing that like tastes like fish oil. And you're like, <laughs> all day, okay? But that kind of bitter taste, you kind of get, you, you, you probably tasted stuff that just leaves this really weird bad taste in the back of your throat that's typically because there's something bitter that is in it. Like we've adjusted the coffee, I like it. <laughs> All right, bases though um, are, unlike acids, which are really good at dissolving grease, like if you get an acid, like if you get some vinegar on your hands, rub it, rinse, it'll like leave your hands feeling really dry. It dissolves grease. But if you get bases on your hands, they'll actually dissolve into skin layers. So they don't easily rinse off and they'll leave your fingers feeling very slippery. Good example of this, if you've ever been in the ocean, you feel your skin, it's sort of like, oh, it's really slippery feeling. Like your skin feels slick. That is because the, base, the ocean is slightly basic because of those calcium carbonates that are dissolved in. So it'll give that slippery feeling. Another like example that's very frustrating is if you get bleach on your hands, you rinse your hands, hands are slippery. Rinse your hands, hands are slippery. You like get soap and wash, hands are still slippery. Like it takes forever. And it's actually because the bleach like rinses into skin layers. That is why it's more difficult to remove. So Arrhenius said, okay, if you have a base, NaOH, and you put it in water, so sodium hydroxide actually exists as a solid lye. If you put it in water, and hydrate it just like we did with the acid. The characteristic ion you end up with a base are the hydroxide ions. And that is the OH. So you remember the hydroxide. Bronsted and Lowry came back and said, well, not all bases produce this hydroxide ion, but instead bases that produce this hydroxide ion, they want to accept a hydrogen ion. So these are considered hydrogen acceptors. So there's an example that I can show in these, both of these, that actually demonstrates like what happens when acids are added to water or bases are added to water and how they end up affecting what water does. So in the first one, this one's really one that we talked about in the previous one about how like hydrochloric acid, when it dissolves in water, it makes that hydronium ion. So you see that HCl loses its hydrogen. So they call it a hydrogen donor, right? I always just think of it as, as the one that loses its hydrogen is the one that's the acid. Then if you look at water, you follow it and you see that it gains a hydrogen. It gains that hydrogen ion to become H3O plus. That means it's a base. But now let's look at the one down at the bottom because ammonia, which is a weak base, not a strong base like sodium hydroxide. So ammonia, when it goes, is added to water, it will actually pull a hydrogen off of the water molecule and in doing so, it forms that hydroxide ion. So if you follow NH3, 
So do you see how NH3 becomes NH4 plus? Do you see that it gains a hydrogen ion in this reaction? So that makes it a base. So remember the one that gains hydrogen is always the base. The one that loses the hydrogen is always the acid. But what's interesting is in this one, water loses its hydrogen ion. So water forms the hydroxide ion. So if it loses a hydrogen ion, water acts like an acid in this. So it loses H plus. In the example above, it actually gained a hydrogen. So water has the ability to act as an acid or a base, depending on the condition of the solution that it's in. So if you add an acid to water, then water acts like a base. If you add a, add a base to water, the water ends up acting like the acid. So because one's going to give up a hydrogen or take a hydrogen, and it gets it from the water molecule. So if you remember then, if you, you can identify an acid and a base in a reaction, the acid is always going to lose the H+. So it's a little like those redox, the oxidation reduction reactions. Bases are always going to gain the H plus in the reaction. So you just look at the reactant side, compare it to the product side, and you can identify it that way. So what about these ions? So ones we've talked about, we have used hydrochloric acid quite a bit in lab. Right? Even last week when we did the neutralization reaction, you had a whole flask of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid. We've also used sulfuric acid, H2SO4, quite a bit in lab. We used it when we made aspirin. It was a catalyst. Then we also made the oil of wintergreen. It was another catalyst. We used both of these in the very first lab that we did. You put these on the cotton squares. And remember the sulfuric acid, when you picked up the cotton square, what happened to the spot? Does anybody remember in the very first lab? There was a hole in it. It like actually ate a hole in the cotton square. So it was like my goal of being like, you gotta be careful with this stuff, <laughs> okay? Trying to scare you into wearing goggles. <laughs> so sulfuric acid, it's in high concentrations, has this ability to really break down stuff. Hydrochloric acid, same thing. So like even in lab last week, I said, this is diluted, but it's about the concentration of stomach acid. If you got it in your eyes, it would really burn. You'd have to use an eye wash. And the reason is, is because these are strong acids. Strong acids, remember a strong electrolytes when we did the light bulb experiment? Strong acids dissociate 100%. So if I took hydrochloric acid and I put it in water, it will form 100% hydrogen ions. And those hydrogen ions, they'll combine with water if nothing else is there. But if there is any kind of living tissue, they are going to react with it. So strong acids, and in fact, strong bases. One of the ones that we used was sodium hydroxide. This is what we used when we made soap. And some of you were even like going, oh, my hands are kind of red and itchy by the end of that lab, like having to really rinse your hands, rinse your hands, because sodium hydroxide's like Drano, okay? So it's like getting Drano on your hands. You would rinse your hands, try to make sure that you rinse them excessively. The reason is sodium hydroxide is a strong base. So when I put it in water, it forms 100% ions. Lots of those hydroxide ions Lots of reactive hydrogen ions if it's an acid, hydroxide ions if it's a base, react with any kind of body tissue they come in contact with. So that term they use is called corrosive. So if you see a chemical, like most of the time it's a cleaning chemical, if you see a chemical and it says caution, corrosive, the term corrosive means that this chemical has the ability to react with body tissues and cause damage. So you try to limit your exposure. Limit your exposure to the skin surface. Definitely any kind of ingestion is an issue. Don't want to get it in your eyes, okay? Protection, trying to use PPE to protect yourself from things that are corrosive. So these are all what they call strong acids and bases. Just remember, strong acids and bases are strong electrolytes. They form 100% ions. 
But what about those weak electrolytes? So remember the weak electrolytes. The weak electrolytes, that was the one that when we dissolved it in water and put it up on the light bulb apparatus, it only glowed dimly. So it only carried a little bit of a current. So the example and the thing that we actually used was vinegar. So I even had Mary smell it so that she could tell me for sure it was vinegar, right? And so we added the vinegar was dissolved in water. And this arrow specifically should go like this, right? Because it's a weak electrolyte. So it doesn't form 100% ions. Instead, only about five out of 100 molecules form the ions. 95% of the vinegar molecules remain as a whole. So in that beaker that we tested, so we had the little beaker with, in the water. So in that, most of the molecules were CH3OOH. Most of the vinegar, vinegar molecules existed like a covalent molecule, no ions. Covalent molecules, remember, like the sugar, they, these would act like a non-electrolyte. They can't carry an electric current because they don't produce any kind of ion. So we have lots of these. 95 out of 100 of the molecules would be like this. So CH3, COOH, lots and lots of these non-ion forms of vinegar. But there may be, out of 100, we're going to have five that are this. And those are the ones that can carry the current because those formed ions. So they could carry the current back and forth, but there weren't very many of them, which is why it was a really dim light bulb. because they only made a few ions. Weak acids and bases exist. And the reason that they're like this is the vinegar molecule is actually more stable not being an ion. It's more stable like this. It's not very reactive. It tends to not want to give its hydrogen ions to everything it sees. So if you get some vinegar on you, do you go like, <laughs> okay, they're not as corrosive because it doesn't make as many ions. Now, it will still react with things, but not as quickly. And so this is why, like, you put vinegar on, like, your potato chips <laughs> or on your french fries. Like, I have some friends that are all about some vinegar on fries. They're those, those European people, <laughs> okay? But that is, like, you ingest it. You wouldn't be ingesting hydrochloric acid, right? So you wouldn't want to be ingesting something that was a strong acid, but weak acids are those that we more commonly come in contact with because they're less reactive. They don't make as much hydrogen ions. They're less corrosive, less potential for body damage. Same thing with bases. There are bases that are weak bases. And the one that I gave you as the example previously is ammonia. So ammonia, which is really smelly, but it is still actually considered a weak base because, again, not very much of it forms ions. The small amount of ions that are formed form those hydroxide ions, but 95% of that ammonia remains in a gas, which is why when you take the bottle off of the ammonia and smell it, you can smell it very strongly because it wants to form that NH3 instead of form the ionized form. So this side, 95%, only 5%. Okay? So strong bases, strong acids, they're going to make 100% ions. Weak acids, weak bases are only going to form a small percentage of ions. They're just more stable in an unionized form. So what do you do if you have a strong acid and a strong base and you want to be able to get rid of them? 
okay? Because you really don't want to have like strong acids and bases hanging around if you don't need them because of how corrosive they are. So you can actually neutralize them. So the two strong acids and bases that are commonly thought of are these two. So hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. If these two are put together, hydrochloric acid, remember that if I put it in water, I have hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Sodium hydroxide, if I put it in water, I have sodium ions and hydroxide ions because they split immediately into their ions once you put them in water. So all of these would be AQ, 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 AQ. But as soon as they come in contact with each other, the sodium is going to be balanced by the what? What would be a stable combination? The sodium is Cl. Mm -hmm. So the sodium in chloride dissolved. But then what happens to the H and the OH? H plus OH makes H2O. So you can take these two very reactive acids and bases, combine them together, and you can make a salt and water. So sodium chloride, sure, you put that on things all the time, right? So it's very neutral. It doesn't have any corrosive characteristics. It's not reactive with body tissues. So by mixing a strong acid and base, you can convert them to a salt and water. So we actually did this like last week in lab. Last week in lab, just remember, strong acid and strong base will make a salt and water, two relatively neutral components. That's why they call this a neutralization reaction. It is a way of reducing the amount of acid or base present in a solution. And if you mix them exactly equal, then you're not going to have an acid or a base left over. They'll be completely neutralized. So antacids do this as a way of reducing stomach acid. So for me, it's Mexican food. I really, really like salsa and all the things that are associated, cilantro, onions, everything. But I sometimes get acid indigestion afterwards. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> okay, just because too much stomach acid that can be triggered because of spicy foods, because of excess like tomatoes, which are already acidic, that can up your stomach acid content. So if you have too much acid in the stomach and there's pressure on the stomach, that can force some of those acids past the little muscle that's supposed to keep acids in your stomach and push it up and it'll come up into the esophagus. So the esophagus is where food goes down into the stomach. It should not come back out. But some people have what's called acid reflux. Acid reflux, indigestion, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, all same thing, okay? So it's just some form of indigestion. And it may just be an occasional thing because you eat a lot of acids and that adds to the stomach acid and that gives you way too much acid. So one way that you can counterbalance this indigestion sensation is by taking an antacid. So I'm not going to drink sodium hydroxide, even though there's hydrochloric acid in my stomach, right? Because sodium hydroxide is like Drano. That would like damage my mouth. That would damage my throat. It would damage the, the, the tissues well before it got to my stomach. But instead, I take a weak base. So I can use a weak base, which is really what an antacid is. So an antacid, it's a weak base. Remember, weak bases don't make a lot of ions. So when you put them in your mouth and chew them up, they're terrible and chalky tasting, <laughs> right? So you chew them up and then you have to swallow them and like, like run, rinse them down with some water because they're, they're not very soluble in water. Magnesium hydroxide, calcium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, very common antacids that are used. But what they'll do here is, so this is the Rolaids. So Rolaids, the magnesium hydroxide in Rolaids, reacts with that stomach acid and converts some of that stomach acid to a salt and water. And so that's going to do what to your stomach acid? It helps to decrease it. And if you decrease the amount of stomach acid, then that is going to help relieve those symptoms. So people that have sort of like random, like, you know, like every once in a while, 
kind of acid indigestion, these can work very well. I do know people, they like eat these on a daily basis, okay? Well, that's, it's not necessarily the best process for you, but you know, that's like kind of what they go to. But just think like an antacid is a weak base. A weak base will react with some of the stomach acid. It's not gonna react with all of it. We don't really need it to react with all of the stomach acid. We just wanna react with the excess stomach acid so that we can lower that stomach acid down to kind of a normal level because stomach acid is really important in breaking down proteins. So it's really important in digestion. You actually need some, but some people either make too much stomach acid or they eat stuff that has an awful lot of acids and spicy stuff in it. Interestingly, the carbonates. See calcium carbonate, see that CO3? Sodium bicarbonate is NaH, CO3. Both of these, when you take these for acid indigestion, one of the products is this, carbon dioxide, it's a gas. So inevitably, what are you going to do 10 to 15 minutes after you take this? <laughs> Almost always, you end up burping, right? And you burp because that's carbon dioxide. So gas begins to build up in your stomach. So don't be surprised. You can even tell people, like, that's just some carbon dioxide. I'll be fine. <laughs> okay? Any of the carbonates that are used as an antacid, they will always have carbon dioxide as one of their byproducts. And it's because of that CO3 group. So that carbonate group, when it reacts with acid, always generates carbon dioxide. And so if you were in lab last week, remember like the calcium carbonate and the sodium carbonate, they bubbled. And you could actually sit there and see this fizz coming off of them. That's that carbon dioxide that was produced. Magnesium hydroxide was the first one you used. That was the pain in the neck one to get to dissolve right? You're like pounding it to get it dissolved. That one, notice there's no CO2. That was the one that didn't bubble. That was just the one that was not very soluble. Took a lot of stirring and breaking up in that first sec part that we did. But Tums and the baking soda, they, they worked pretty well in terms of neutralizing stomach acid. So now this brings us into how things work when we are talking about acids and bases when they don't react like as a strong acid and base making a salt and water. We can have some reactions of acids and bases that create what's called the equilibrium. So remember that if you see the arrow going in both directions, then that indicates this is a reaction that is reversible. So there is a forward reaction and a reverse reaction. So they use this as an example, this N2 plus three H2s, they're both gases, form two NH3s. So it's not an acid or a base, it's just their generic example. It would have been better if it was an acid or a base, but they didn't use them that way. But in this, what this is saying is if I have a container and I start off and I pump nitrogen into this container, so I put a bunch of nitrogen into this container, and then I pump a bunch of hydrogen into this container too, so H2, 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 all right? They are going to run into each other and they will begin to form NH3. So I will have some NH3 that is produced. So some of this hydrogen and nitrogen, they will form NH3. Then some more of this hydrogen and nitrogen, they will form NH3. But I will eventually get to this point where the amount of NH3 formed then begins to start breaking back down into hydrogen and nitrogen. So I have this forward reaction until I get some amount of product, they don't have to be equal, but I get some amount of product at that point, when I make product, that product will break back down into reactants. So eventually in my container, I will have all three things. So I don't have just product, I will actually have reactant and product in a ratio and that is what they call equilibrium. So chemical equilibrium is when the amount of product and reactant doesn't change in a reaction. And the reason is because the forward and reverse reactions are equal. So product forming, reactant forming. When those, when those reaction rates are equal, then I'll have no net change. So then I think of it as like a balance. 
So I start off with nitrogen and hydrogen, and then so lots of nitrogen and hydrogen, and then it begins to make more ammonia, more NH3, more NH3, and eventually I reach this point of balance. That's equilibrium. So Le Chatelier, he studied this, okay? It's a French guy, <coughs> okay? French chemist, spent his entire life studying this. And he said, all right, if I have this reaction and it's at equilibrium, what happens if I add or remove something from my container? So what if I add nitrogen? What if I remove hydrogen? What if I add NH3? Like what actually happens to equilibrium if I upset it? So think of it as being the seesaw. What happens if you upset the seesaw? Well, the goal, remember, is to try and get things back to a balance. So you will have shifts in a reaction to try and restore balance. So the goal is, is always think like I want to get it back to a balance. So he found there are two things that happen. If I add anything to a reaction that is at equilibrium, that will cause the reaction to always shift away from whatever I add. Doesn't matter, matter if I add reactant or product. If you add reactant or product, not and, this is or, to a reaction that's at equilibrium, the reaction will always shift away from whatever you added. So think of this as the seesaw. Okay, so I have reactant and product, right? Reactants on the left, products on the right. If I'm at equilibrium, they're equal. Forward and reverse, so it's now balanced. I'm at equilibrium. So if I add reactant, which way is my seesaw going to be, become heavier? The left side, right? So if I add R, if I add reactant, do you see that that would mean the reactant side would be heavier? So the only way for me to be able to bring it back into balance is I'd have to make more what? If reactant side's heavy, I need to make more product. And the only way to more, make more product is to cause the reaction to shift towards the product side. So the reaction, if I can get the reaction to shift this direction, it'll come back into balance. So if I add reactant, the reaction shifts away from the reactant, the forward reaction occurs in order to restore balance. Okay, so it doesn't matter what the reactant is. If I add reactant, the reaction is always gonna shift forward. What if I added product? So if I have this reactant and product and I add P, which side is going to get heavier? The right side. So product side compared to reactant side, right? So this side becomes heavier. And if that's the case, the only way to restore balance is to make the reaction shift to the left. Mm -hmm. So if I can get the reaction to shift to the left, that's going to be the reverse reaction. It will restore the balance between reactant and product. So it doesn't matter which reactant or which product I'm talking about, any reactant or product that is added, the reaction always shifts away from whatever I add. So if one side gains a substance, the reaction always shifts away is the way to remember it. What if I take away though? So what if I have this balance and then I have a way to siphon off a reactant or a product? 
So if I pull reactant or product, whichever side I pull from, that side will end up being out of equilibrium. That side will have less, so you can think of it as being lighter. So the reaction always shifts towards whatever I remove. So if you remove reactant or product, the reaction will always shift towards what you removed. So in looking, if I have R and P, reaction and product, and they're at equilibrium, because we're always going to start at equilibrium, so we're already starting off balanced. If I remove R, which way will the reaction shift, forward or reverse? If I remove R, then it's going to be like that, right? Because if I remove, then R becomes less. Oh, I sorry, I drew it the exact wrong way. If I remove R, it's going to be like this. So the only way to restore it would be to go in reverse. So if I can get the reaction to shift back, that's going to restore that balance. And so that is the reverse reaction. If I remove product, product side would become lighter, the forward reaction would bring it back. So the general rule in this, if I add anything, the reaction shifts away from whatever I add, okay? So if I add, it shifts away, so the A's. If I remove, then it's gonna shift towards whatever I removed. So look at this one. So if I have NH3 plus HSO4 plus heat, and we'll talk about heat next time, makes NH4 plus and SO4 two minus. What will happen if I add, so this reaction's at equilibrium, so you tell me if I add NH4 plus, what you gotta do is find NH4 plus in the reaction, determine if it's a reactant or product. Whichever I'm adding, the reaction's gonna shift which way? Towards or away? Away. So find NH4 plus, where do you see it? It's on the product side, so that means the reaction's gonna shift away. It's going to shift in reverse. What about the second one? What if I remove SO4 2 minus? So anytime I remove, the reaction is going to shift towards whatever I took out. So where is SO4 2 minus? See that it's over on the right side, so it's a product. So that means which side, which way will the reaction shift? Forward. Because mm -hmm. I took that away, so the reaction shifts towards whatever I removed. What if I removed HSO4 minus? If I removed HSO4 minus, forward or reverse? Reverse. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, if I add NH3, find NH3, the reaction shifts away from NH3. So which way would it shift? In the forward. Okay, we'll practice more of these because I got a bunch of them. <laughs> okay, we got a bunch of them to do. We'll also talk about heat next time. I think I got everybody that Juana did come in. Samaya is here. Emaya is not here. I need to know because of people, Madison's here, Rayleigh is here, Samaya is here, Sherry, I need to talk to then. Catherine.